Hey, welcome back to Innovate Africa. I'm Kino Cummies, and as always, we discuss innovative businesses that impact lives on the African continent. And whenever I do these interviews, you might have picked up, I always talk about skills flow. Where are these African skills we need to build the technology businesses? Well, why am I so interested in that? Well, we've got 750 million young people under the age of 21 on the African continent. This is the place to be if you're looking for young people who can contribute towards building the world. So I'm going to introduce you to the founder of Zio, Mvelo Shope. Thank you very much for your time. Let's start with the first things first. I always ask this of every person I interview, people who've started these innovative businesses. Why do you get out of bed in the morning? What's your purpose? So we essentially skill up young African talent to be able to be relevant and competitive in the employment and job markets so that businesses and startups such as Zio and those around us can actually access this talent more affordably but more competitively to be able to push their solutions across the world. So Velo, how do you know what technology to teach young people? You've got everything from Python to AI agents, you name it. There's tons of it out there. And some people can go down the wrong path, teach the wrong technology, and those young people don't end up getting jobs. How do you deal with that? So we actually work with employers before um, putting together our courses. So we have to marry two things, right? The first is accreditation, which is set by SACWA and the national body that regulates any training. Um, and then what businesses are actually looking for. So we go to a startup, for example, and ask them, what are the skill sets that you're currently looking for? What are you building? What stacks are you using? Um, and then we go to corporate companies as well to ask the similar questions. What are the skills that you're looking for? And those conversations are obviously a lot longer. So we need to ask them, you know, what are the skills that you're looking for now? And what might you be looking for tomorrow as well? And then that's when we create our courses. And then that's when we get the young people to actually train in what we teach. So Zara has been around for a good couple of years, but I think it's always worthwhile talking about the founding story, talking about that tipping point that led you on this journey to launching this business that generates skills that we desperately need on the African continent. So we, we actually started the business in, in varsity. Um, so one of our peers, he was basically looking to work for a large organization, a large tech organization. Um, they asked him, what skill sets does he have? Um, what projects has he, had, had they built? Um, and we found that they, what he was being taught at university was slightly outdated, first of all, and he didn't have a portfolio to actually show what he was able to do. So that's essentially what we started doing. We started getting projects in and around the Cape Town region because we started uh, while here, and we would basically match those projects with um, people studying towards something technical, so within the ICT space. Then we saw that that gap was actually bigger than we thought. So we started upskilling those people first, and then over time realized we could actually train somebody that has never coded before. I mean, we sit with a large unemployment problem in this country. Um, people are studying um, and going into careers that may seem to be dying off. So how do we, we started thinking, how do we then upskill those people to actually take advantage of this tech boom um, and then actually be relevant as well uh, across the world and not just here on the continent. I firmly believe that talent is equally distributed, right? But opportunity isn't. So how do you go about taking that opportunity where the talent exists, but alongside that talent exists this drought of opportunity? How do you fill that gap? That's a very good question. So I think, you know, one of the, 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 the good things that came with things like, you know, COVID-19, COVID you know, everyone, um, you know, was impacted by that, but it was the acceleration of that distribution of opportunities. So one of the things we're really big on is getting our learners internationally competitive so that they can actually take advantage of the opportunities that are spread across the world. We would love it that, you know, a young South African um, in Umlazi, or Soweto or the Cape Flats is able to um, access an opportunity from the States where they now bring in dollars into this country and are able to live a good life for themselves, but also 
um, driving economic activity locally. So over these past couple of years, let's talk about some of the traction that you've managed to gain. So we've tra trained well into the thousands now. So at this point, we're training um, at least 500 annually. So that's across our boot camps. So we have four boot camps or two boot camps that we, we train in now. And we take about 30 learners every two months um, for each of those boot camps. Um, in well, anything between 30 to 40. And then um, we're introducing another two more boot camps as well um, towards the end of this year. So we're looking to get to a point where we annually are training um, over a thousand people. But right now we're just over the halfway mark with that. So we've maintained um, a really high completion rate, which is sitting about 90%. And our placement rate is at about 92%. So most of the people that actually go through our platform and um, our training programs actually get a job at the end of it. We both know running businesses not very easy at all. Lots of pain and suffering in between all the laughs, right? But when you put your head down at night, there's something that sometimes tells you as a founder, it's all worth it. Can you maybe share a story or two that makes you smile when you put your head down at night? Maybe one or two people whose lives you've impacted through Zao. 100%. So, um, so some of our programs are actually sponsored by companies as well for, for, for learners. So learners that wouldn't necessarily be able to afford some of our training. So there's a specific in, um, encounter that we had with an individual who, um, she, I mean, she was down and out. She didn't know what to do. Young person, very similar story that you'd hear if you just walk down the street in all honesty in South Africa. And... You know, she trained with us over 12 months, slightly longer program, and I mean, she ended up working for one of the banks. Um, after that, a few months later, she started working for uh, another ICT business. And now she's fast on her track to, you know, being a proper developer in the space. I think another story that I really love sharing is, um, you know, in the, some of the earlier days, we, we had somebody that was a, a security guard. Um, that actually came onto our platform. He upskilled with us, was able to be a place on a project that we, you know, helped source for them as well. And I mean, now they're a fully fledged developer. So, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people think that you need to be a maths boffin to become a dev. As far as you're concerned, what are those core skills that you need as an individual in order to be successful in this field? Yeah, so the biggest one is that you actually have to want to. You have to want to be to, to be a developer. We find that a lot of people real or, or get told that um, you need to be in ICT, you need to pursue a career in tech, but you know, a lot of people just don't want to do that. So if you want to, you will definitely thrive in this trade, or you have a much larger chance to, to actually thrive. One of the other things, you need to be a lifelong learner. You can't be um, you know, training in whatever course, and then you think that's that. In the ICT space, you need to always be training. You need to always be learning because there's new technologies that come out every day. I mean, we're seeing it now, um, especially with the boom of AI. You wake up tomorrow, it's a new technology. You wake up the next day, it's something else totally different as well. Um, and I think the last one is um, you, you need to naturally um, be wanting to solve challenges and you need to be wanting to solve large challenges. So you get stuck on you know, a bug, for example, you get stuck on, you know, uh, an, an issue within the, you know, if you're learning coding, for example, within the, 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 the development cycle. And if you're one person that just says, okay, I'm done now, um, you, you're really not going to go far in this space. How's your business staying at the cutting edge? Because everything from large language models to the GPT explosion to now discussions around uh, such an Adela talking about SaaS companies being replaced by AI agents. What is your take on that and how do you keep yourself on that cutting edge? Yeah, that's a brilliant question. And I think I really love the use of the word evolving. I mean, developers have to evolve as with any profession as well. Um, I think we've seen with accountants over the years, with the introduction of you know, other SaaS products coming in, um, you don't necessarily start the books from scratch. Now you have templates that you work on, um, and then those have even integrated with um, AI itself, or the, itself, and actually make the job easier for those individuals. The same thing is going to be happening with developers. The use of um, co-pilots, the use of all these other new AI innovations is to make the job more efficient, but also 
uh, make it easier for anyone to actually build you know, bigger and better projects. So I think developers themselves shouldn't be stressing about um, the introduction of AI, um, but rather should be embracing the introduction to be able to be more efficient in the work that they do. And for us as a, as a company and you know, what we do is we're teaching for that. We, we use AI in the, in the training process. We encourage our learners to actually use all these tools as they're learning um, so that they become better developers at the end of the day. It's one thing getting involved in entry-level dev work and training those core skills. It's what we need. It's the foundation. But a lot of international companies are looking for more senior devs. Do you get involved in upskilling, let's say, mid-level devs to become senior devs, senior devs to take on bigger management roles, for example? Is it currently on your roadmap? Let's talk about that. So when we train developers, we know we, we focus on people that have no skill in the space and try to get them to get proficient, right? Um, when we get people looking to hire talent, we, we have individuals or companies that you know, request the same thing. Do you have an intermediate developer? Do you have a senior developer? So there is still a very big gap um, in the training component to, to move you know, those, those junior developers into you know, intermediates and then so on and so forth. So I think it's, that conversation is far more nuanced to then saying, okay, how can um, a training organization like Zio fill that gap? It's more of a, a collaborative effort between a training institution like Zio, a corporate company, and sometimes even um, government intervention, so that it's, it's a, we were working hand in hand to solve that specific problem, because we do need a lot more um, you know, mid-level mid developers in the country. We do need a whole lot more um, senior level de de developers in the country, so that we're not outsourcing those skills and actually having them here locally. So it, it goes far beyond a training institution like Zio and the, the others that um, sit in the same space as us to be able to get those mid-level developers the experience needed for them to become seniors. Um, to get those senior developers um, the kind of experience and interaction and practical application to then become managers and then the cycle will then continue. Tell me a bit about your business model and why you are investable as a business? We, we, we basically run uh, cohorts. Um, so we run boot camps um, every two months. So we do coding education, so full stack web development, and then we do data science, and then soon it's cybersecurity and um, cloud computing. People pay 29,500 per, um, per head or per seat, and then we essentially do a cohort of anything between 30 to, to 40 to 45 learners per cohort. So you are making money. We are making money, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I love that book by Bono Mohale, chairman of Bidvest. He talks about lifting as you rise, lifting other people with you. But I also want to focus on you know, your rise and some of the pitfalls that you might have had to contend with, I'm almost sure you had lots of pitfalls to contend with uh, in order to become a success. I mean, yeah, so I mean, we, as, as I said, we started the business when we were studying. Um, so I mean, there, there were obviously challenges with that, um, you know, failing courses, coming back to repeat certain courses, because you're actually trying to, <laughs> to do something, yeah. um, you know, outside of just the, you know, the lecture hall. Um, I think that, I mean, that's obviously behind us now. So, I mean, when we all moved into the business full-time straight out of varsity, um, you know, we, were, we just, we weren't making enough money as we thought we, we would be at that time. And then COVID came on top of that. And then we literally all had to go home. Um, the business was close to shutting down. Um, we literally, we just had enough money to pay for I guess the sales products that we were paying for to pay for, you know, to, to keep the, the platform on. Um, we spent a couple of months, and I mean, I have founders that aren't from South Africa as well, so they're from Malawi and Kenya, and then, you know, they had to go to their countries as well. So that was a, probably the, the darkest time for us where we weren't paying salaries, we weren't, um, we had, you know, we just weren't in a comfortable position to actually build the business as best as we could. So. Yeah, we, we got over that. And then, I mean, through the years, you do get other challenges where, you know, you are not just running out of runway, but, you know, you're not getting 
um, the opportunities that you think you, you want to be getting. Um, yeah, that's pretty much been that. So you've had quite a long stretch in this business. You've learnt a lot of lessons. We've spoken about, you know, knocking one's head every now and then. What are some of the key lessons that you can share, just based on your experience, some of the key lessons that you can share with up and coming founders? Yeah, I think the biggest one for me is, is really around patience. Um, that's definitely the biggest. When you start the business, you think you're going to be, you know, 10xing over the next year. Or so um, that's that's really the case. And I mean, when you then rush, I guess, the process itself, you you really lose yourself in the process. Which you know, if you're the founder and you've lost yourself, you you start to make really dumb decisions. You know, I think that's the best way I can put it. Um, and you burn out. You you know you you just you don't operate optimally. Um, and I think when you bring that kind of anxiety as well to yourself, where you, you think the business was going to be somewhere where um, it, it end up, ended up not being um, at the time frame that you had set up for yourself, um, you may lose hope. And then at the end of the day, you may actually just you know, want to close the business. You start taking money from the, you know, the wrong investors, et cetera, et cetera. So just be patient with yourself, be patient with the journey. And then um, ideally, you'll get the best results from that. What are some of the other pieces of the puzzle that you still need to put together? So one of the things that we're look, looking to do now is actually enter rural areas specifically. So, I mean, we always hear that, you know, there's connectivity issues. People in those areas don't have the devices. Um, there's socioeconomic issues that uh, may prevent people from being able to finish a full program. You know, that's the challenge we're now heading at majority of young people actually in this country stay in those areas. And if we're not going there to unearth the talent there, you know, what are we really doing all of this for? So anyone and any partner that's looking to do something similar, we are willing to work with them. Mvelo Shlope, thank you very much for your time. There we go, the man behind Zao. This is what the continent needs. It's no use having all of these young people and we don't skill them to be successful. We don't skill them to build the world. We don't skill them to bring foreign currency in and create a better life for all Africans on our continent. We need more businesses like this. And this really is what Innovate Africa is about, highlighting these amazing stories. I'll see you on the show next week.